Before we begin, I wanted to say another big thank you to Jeff and Grady and the rest of the Distributed Global team for hosting this event. This has been really a blast. So thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. So as I mentioned at the top, for anyone that, that, that wasn't here, my name is Devin James. I co-run the Web3 Working Group, which is a nonprofit basically advocating for uh, awareness around these kind of projects, distributed compute type projects. Permanent data storage is something that's been interesting to me personally for a really long time. Almost 10 years ago, I started a project called the Decentralized Library of Alexandria that was all about that and what you can do and how it can change everything by having permanent storage. And it is a hard problem to solve itself, but it also comes with a lot of really interesting and complex extra issues. And these four gentlemen are all experts on that because they're all building on the PermaWeb and building really cool products on the PermaWeb. So I have the honor and privilege of, of uh, working with them on this. So on stage with me are Sam Williams, the inventor and, co and founder of the Arweave Protocol and the CEO of Forward Research. Philip Materas, the founder and CEO of AR.io. Brendan Lamy, the founder of Quill, and Tate Barenbaum, the founder of Community Labs. So please help me uh, give them a round of applause and thank you for being with us today. All right, to begin, uh, I want you guys to tell me what you're, you're all working on the same protocol basically, but you have slightly different uh, uh, focuses that your companies are working on. So tell me what your company is working on within that space itself. Thanks. Um, so. Hi, I'm Sam. Um, I was the person that uh, initiated the Arweave protocol. I led uh, its development during the early years. Um, I now run Forward Research, which is a incubation type outfit where we really, we try and work out what are the uses of the PermaWeb that people haven't noticed yet, and then try and pave the way for people to discover them. So one of the things you get with permanent information storage is the ability to build web applications that run forever without a centralized controller. And what that means is it allows you to create systems that disintermediate the flow of information in society. And so this is just one of the streams we're, we're very interested in um, helping people explore. And so we're incubating a, a bunch of different founders who if you uh, come along to Permapalooza, which is very kindly put together by <laughs> the ARIO, R Drive, and um, uh, Quill teams on Friday, yeah, th they'll be uh, discussing there. But, so, so we look at a number of different streams of the ways that the, the protocol can be used um, that the, I would say, public consciousness hasn't yet realized yet. Great, yeah, my name's Phil, um, and you know, we're building a few things that rely on permanent data. Um, we started with uh, a dApp called R Drive, um, easy to use app, lets you upload, download, share your public or private files on Arweave, um, really easy to use. Um, you know, we focus on making it very private. We don't collect any information about you. Uh, I said it's a dApp, it's not just an app um, because our drive itself is hosted on our weave. Um, so, you know, like the data that's uploaded to it, the app itself is immutable, censorship resistant, time stamped, et, et cetera. Um, but that's just some of the software we're building. Underpinning um, the R Drive app um, is the R Weave file system, which is a, a data protocol that we created that tags your R Weave transactions in a certain way to make them look and feel like a file system. So you can create drives, folders, and files. You can assign permissions and have permissions uh, and have. Uh, uh, yeah, controls on top of that, um, and it's a platform for people to build. Um, so you can build something that's on top of, of our drive. Um, but we're also doing some infrastructure now as well. Um, this is the RIO network, um, and that's a decentralized network of gateways that sit on top of our weave um, that really give uh, a good level of performance for the apps that use our weave, like our drive. So a gateway will cache any transactions that's going through it. It will propagate that data to the broader Arweave network. Um, it'll index um, transactions. We just talked about how important um, uh, being able to query an index for blockchain data is. Um, so gateways do that. And other uh, nice features like naming systems and uh, things that just make it easy to build apps on top of, uh, of Arweave. Um, and then we're also exploring looking at that decentralized solution and running it like a SaaS for companies really interested um, in getting data in and out of Arweave, um, but they may not have the expertise to do it. They may not want to deal with uh, wallets or tokens. Um, so we put together a service for them uh, that's really scalable and, and can grow with uh, the needs of, of an enterprise. Um, yeah, excited to, to talk to you more today about what we're doing. 
Uh, my name is Brennan. I'm the founder of Quill. It's, uh, just, you can find us at quill.com, K-W-I-L. Um, and Quill, we are building uh, decentralized relational databases on our weave. So uh, for any DBAs or business analysts out there, you probably recognize uh, SQL as a, a way for querying databases. And we are building this for one, permissionless applications, but two, composable applications. And so starting with that first one, I think permissionless probably uh, makes a lot of sense to people in this room. Uh, smart contracts are permissionless. Uh, smart contract functions like the ERC20 transfer function, uh, anybody can call these. And you can deploy smart contracts as a game, essentially. And as long as people play within the rules of these games, they can use that underlying protocol, that underlying smart contract, and it will continue running like that. We have brought that same concept to databases uh, and relational databases specifically. So you can deploy a schema for data. You can define who is able to interact with it, how they can. What are the different ways they can write to it? You know, how, how can people update it? Who can update it? How can people read it back? Um, and then similarly, you can also take these applications, and if Tate here has a really valuable one, and I think it's interesting, I can directly import that, just like, just like a smart contract, just like a, a package from NPM. I can just say import Tate's database. It forces me to play within the rules of that game. Um, we're also building in some really interesting incentives. So, you know, maybe Tate has some particularly valuable columns uh, and he wants to make sure that the DAO of his that is producing valuable data is getting paid for those. Um, he can say, this costs this much money. And so if you use this, whoever is executing that, they have to pay at execution time. You can sort of think of this like gas cost of smart contracts. Similarly, we're doing a lot of really interesting work in pricing relational databases uh, based on computational complexity. Just even in the Web2 space, this has really never been done before, and this is kind of where we're breaking ground uh, regardless of industry. Um, and then finally, and I think this would be particularly exciting to a lot of people that are members of DAOs here, uh, if your DAO is producing valuable data, we're building tools that allow you to get more value from that data. Um, you know, if you take a decentralized social protocol, for example, um, in, in Facebook and Twitter, the most valuable things they create are data. Um, but in decentralized socials, the, the DAOs themselves aren't gaining much, much value from that data. And so we are making it very easy for you to deploy these complex data sets and then have value directly accrue to either that DAO treasury or that token. And it's about as easy to build and deploy as a smart contract. You don't need to set up complex data infrastructure for it. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming out today. Uh, really excited to be talking. And my name's Tate Berenbaum, uh, founder of Community Labs, which is a software development company and venture studio focused on building tooling and infrastructure inside of the Arweave ecosystem. Um, when I started in Arweave, I, myself and our team were working on Virto, which was the, the first DEX built on a permanent data layer. Um, and as we continued building out Virto and identifying more challenges and opportunities to build infrastructure in the ecosystem, uh, the game for us became to figure out what the most efficient way would be for us to be able to continue building out uh, new initiatives and making it easier for other developers to understand and actually be able to adopt uh, the technology on top of our weave. Um, that's Community Labs. Excellent, thank you. Um, so on the web today, it seems like it's basically impossible to uh, deal with the apparently opposing needs of respecting people's freedom of speech and meeting the content moderation needs that a lot of people really ask for. I've had a theory for a long time that with permanent storage, you kind of get the por qué no los dos, you know, the quote the Doritos commercial, whatever it was, why not both? That when you do, when you can separate the data from the interface, which is kind of something Sam was talking about earlier, that you get from permanent storage, you can solve both sides of that problem. I'm not necessarily talking at all about stuff that is absolutely illegal to put online, because I think the protocol already actually deals with that really effectively. Um, I just wonder, can you each kind of opine about that subject? Am I right about that? Am I wrong about that? Can the protocol itself handle stuff like, you know, pirated content so that it's, that's not a, that's not a censorship issue, that's a legal issue kind of thing? Yeah, um, well, I think it is a censorship issue, and I think that's also okay. I think we should call a duck a duck, right? Or a spade a spade, I forget which, <laughs> what the analogy is. Um, but yeah, look, like the, the protocol needs to be able to deal with people uh, trying to upload data that is not legal to share in many jurisdictions. And the way that it does that is actually relatively simple. Um, the miners in the network, the people that uh, replicate the information, they are paid to do so, but also that information is public on their hard drives. And so they are just responsible parties for the data that they store. Um, what the network is really doing is being a sort of 
a marshalling layer that says, okay, we can link people that want to sell access to their hard drives to other people that want to store data over time. And then it's orchestrating how the payments happen. Um, but what that means is, well, look, you're, you're responsible for what you do. Like if you store data on your hard drive in your jurisdiction, you should make sure that it is legal. Um, and, and so this is actually a relatively you know, simple way of dealing with the problem. Um, all of the data in our weave is public by default, and so you can introspect it. So there's a system that we, we sort of pioneer the creation of. I think it's, it's essentially open source. There's no monetization model for it. But yeah, it's an open source project out there called Shepherd, which basically allows you to scan the network as new data comes in and match it against any sort of um, keyword list you want or ML, you know, AI systems for basically working out, is this something I want to store on my hard drive or not? And then from the point of view of the user, look, Arweave will store your data permanently if you pay, if you upload it, and if someone is willing to store it at every point in time. So everyone is incentivized and, and paid to store the data that they, that they do store, but no one is forced to store things that they don't want to. And, and that's the, that's the um, I was gonna say trade-off, but I don't even really necessarily think this is a trade-off. I don't actually think that any other system is possible to build. So imagine, and some other um, you know, distributed storage networks have tried this, creating systems of sort of plausible deniability. This is, this is a terrible idea, I think, from a moral point of view, as well as from a practical point of view. If you try and say, okay, you don't know what's on your hard drive, well, then people won't take part in your network. They will just go and do something else with their time because they are legally liable for it. So, so I would say when we were designing this, we took the approach that is, um, what do you say, most natural and reasonable. And from the point of view of preserving free speech, look, outside of those uh, bounds, you know, you pay for it, you upload it, and uh, someone is willing to store it somewhere in the world at all points in time, um, the network is there to, to preserve people's right to speak over time, like we, we see that there should be a right to be remembered as much as there should be a right to be forgotten is probably actually much more important. Um, and so, yeah, that, those are the, I guess, principles that the, the network is engineered to uh, fulfill. Yeah, and I think those, those principles are really powerful and, uh, and elegant, right? Because ultimately, how could you force somebody to store something? Right, you, you can't. Um, and what the protocol does is it incentivizes people to store as much as possible. Right, um, and again, I think that's a, a great model and something that uh, this gateway network that we're building on top of our weave um, performs the same function. It follows that same kind of content moderation policy. Um, so kind of in this web two world, you have, you know, big controlled, you know, centralized organizations um, that maybe, you know, are operating out of Silicon Valley and they're reporting to their shareholders and their boards and, you know, they wanna make sure that their platform is, you know, is moderated to their needs. Now you're kind of democratizing that to different countries, different people with different morals, ethoses, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think that's just a, uh, a more fair way to kind of look at the world's set of data and uh, takes that control out of the hands of the few and, and gives it to more, more people. Um, and then there's still other opportunities um, you know, above that, that base protocol of our weave to maybe give more control to users, right? I think there's some other standards around like, well, maybe there is a piece of content that the user who uploaded it doesn't want a gateway to serve it in the future, right? So they could, you know, signal that in a tag. You know, we talked about, you talked about tags before. You know, I do not want this stored beyond this certain time or whatever kind of rules. And then again, gateways, nodes, they can follow that or they could say, hey, I'm incentivized to keep this, I'm gonna store it. Um, so it's just giving more options and, and controls for people and yeah, ultimately democratizes, I think, the content moderation. Yeah, this is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about because uh, kind of how I got here actually is I started by building a decentralized social uh, and the whole point of it was to provide cryptographic guarantees on the rules of the game, you know, who's able to use it but then also incentivize data availability for regions where there is potential like enforced censorship of data availability. Um, and so I've sort of come to see those problems as almost separate. You can enforce the rules of the game for, for data coming in um, and just kind of call back to smart contracts. You know, the smart contract, or in this case, the data you are storing and you know, the system you're putting it in, it should function the same, even if what you're putting in is, is not allowed. I don't think that's the level at which, at which you should block it. 
it should really get blocked at an availability level. And this is, uh, and it's very similar to how the core RE protocol actually handles the issue as well. Um, you have to process the data uh, in order to mine the block. Uh, you need to do that to cryptographically verify that you're properly taking part in this process. But if you find some data abhorrent, you can actually remove that from your system and choose yourself not to make it available to the public. Um, now, it, uh, for relational databases specifically, there comes another kind of third point here that you don't really get in uh, file systems or uh, eventually consistent systems, which is strong consistency. Um, now, for the sake of just, I think, speed and uh, topicality, I'm not gonna really dive into this, but I love talking about this, and so if you're interested in hearing about that, find me after this. Um, but that's kind of how we think of it. We, we think of them as pretty distinctly separate problems. I don't have too much to add to follow that. I, I think that <laughs> it was explained very well, uh, but what I would add is that I think that uh, on top of what Phil was saying, the ability to tag given pieces of data is, is very helpful for front ends or platforms that are indexing those pieces of data to, to say, hey, like I'm either interested in showing this to my users or I'm not. Uh, or even better, giving users the ability to choose which types of data they're interested in seeing versus what they aren't. Um, I think the protocol was very well designed with that in mind. And I think it's cool that there are a few use cases out in the wild and built on top of what infrastructure Phil's working on um, with ARIO. Excellent. All right. So, uh are we even the permaweb are growing quite quickly. So let's say we're looking a few years down the road where the permaweb is actually starting to approach the size of the surface web as it is right now. How do you see that impacting traditional web-based industries and companies like uh, content delivery, data storage services? Are they going to just quickly adopt it because they see the writing on the wall? Are they going to resist and kind of bifurcate it? And how would you suggest encouraging the ones that want to be holdouts to actually get onto the, 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 the Parma web? Let's go ahead and start with Tate this time. Yeah, I think that um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, in, in Web2, a, a very common business model is the idea of siloing data and, and having proprietary data that, that sort of you can monetize and, and make use of from that. Um, one open question, though, for me is what how will this type of technology, as businesses adopt it, affect the way that um, companies are considered defensible? Uh, if in Web2, a lot of a company's mode is defined by the, the data that it, you know, um, that it silos away, what opportunities do we have to change the way that business models can operate inside of Web3 on top of shared data solutions? Um, I also think the composability that you get from being able to build on top of shared, shared data sets is uh, able to supercharge us to, to iterate quicker uh, than we would previously be able to. It's sort of like everyone kind of contributing to open source and, and now, you know, being able to find ways to incentivize the contribution there is, I think, a big opportunity that's, uh, that we're all kind of working towards uh, learning more about. Yeah, for this question uh, specifically, I think I might have a, I don't want to say like an unpopular opinion, but I think quite a few people disagree with me on it, including potentially some people on this panel. Um, and it's that I, I don't really think Web3 is going to come and just totally replace Web2, and everyone on Web2 is just going to come and use Web3. I think we will see some amount of that. I think we already have, but I actually think by and large, that won't happen. The, the majority of companies using Web2, I don't think they're gonna make a migration to Web3 in the next year, five years, 10 years. Um, some of them will, but most won't. Um, and I think my evidence for that, uh, I'm not gonna dive super deep into it, but I would really recommend reading The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. Uh, pretty fundamentally changed how I think about what we should be doing, who we're building this for and why. Um, but the, the, the crux of it is that uh, Web3, you know, th there are drawbacks in Web3. Like, uh, Everything on Web3, you're doing, you're doing most of the same things you're doing in Web2, but there's extra cryptography and verification and consensus involved. So it's slower, it's more expensive, it's less efficient. Um, but what that enables you to do is build things that were previously impossible. And so you know, the, the companies that are thriving right now on what was already possible, I think those will continue to exist. I think, you know, and once again, there are exceptions, but by and large, they're not gonna find better solutions in Web3. And really the growth of Web3 um, and of decentralized technologies will come from people that are able to 
leverage this technology in new ways that allows them to do things that you know, companies that were started 10, 20 years ago just literally could not. Um, and so, yeah, for that reason, I, I think there will be some adoption, but uh, I, I don't think it'll be as grand as a lot of people um, claim it will be. Yeah, and it, you know, I don't think that's that controversial of, uh, of opinion. I, I agree. I mean, especially you look at our weave, it's for permanent data storage, right? Really long-term records retention. So you might not need that for your data. Not all data needs to live forever. So I'm sure there's still going to be some temporary web or legacy web, whatever it's called. Um, but ultimately, I like to think that in the future, yeah, users shouldn't know the difference with what they're accessing, whether it's on the permaweb or not. Um, maybe, you know, digital identities become more prevalent and that is something people have to, to deal with. Um, but I think outside of maybe seeing something in the app or the website that indicates it's stored on Arweave, then I really feel like it shouldn't, you shouldn't know you're using Web3, right? It should be as easy as using Web2 because again, why would people make that switch if it's something harder and if the, they don't understand the, the innovation and some of those kind of magical things that happen in the background. Um, and then I think companies, if their customers demand it, you know, big companies will, yeah, start pushing some of their data to Arweave, start hosting their sites uh, on Arweave um, and just do those kind of integrations in the background again so people don't necessarily know that they're using the permaweb outside of, hey, I don't see any broken links anymore, or I can you know, look at this piece of data and then put it in a blockchain explorer and see all this other information. Um, so at the surface, I think Web3 is gonna look and feel very similar, and to your point, it's not gonna be this big mad rush, um, but once you get underneath it, that's where, uh, yeah, there's gonna be some huge differences, and maybe people will see that, maybe they won't. I think time will tell. Um, yeah, so I just learned that going last gives you uh, more time to think about it, which is yeah. important because now I've got three things to say, but I'll try and keep it quick. <laughs> uh, look, I think uh, the first is the strand of um, adoption of, as, of our weave just as a permanent information storage system. This is already happening in pretty high volume. Um, I, I think this is generally correct. Uh, as, as we said before, like we're probably not going to see too many uh, huge businesses using this from the old old world like immediately I think that they will probably be the last adopters most likely apart from some early you know forays and I'll get to that in a second um, that's how I imagine that will play out but the second thing that I, I think is potentially going to happen and I'm not sure about this I, I would say I'm about like 40 percent sure but I see that with uh, with Arweave, we can create a new sort of web which is data focused. So when you use an application, all the pieces of data are being contributed to this big open data lake where the information is licensed and it can be reused in any different kind of application. And I think that potentially what is going to happen over the maybe like five year time horizon is that the, the web as we know it will morph into something new. It, it won't be about applications so much anymore. The applications will be created on the fly um, by essentially large language models. Like you can ask, hey, show me all of the posts by this person today, and it will look at what is the data that I have that is renderable, and then say, okay, I know that this user likes a blue background or a white background, or they like to see this sort of metadata about that information, and it will just put together the user interface to show the information that the user is interested in to the user at the right time, in the right way, on the fly. Like there's really no need anymore to have applications um, that are big monolithic structures that like you spend five years building and they stay the same for 10 years. Like I think that the applications will essentially become transient and then it will almost become as if the web itself becomes the app and, and you don't upload anymore your content to YouTube, you upload your content to the web. And then it is reused in all these different ways uh, that the, that the uh, creator allows with the license. I don't know that that's gonna happen. Like I said, like 40% likelihood. But if it does, it will be monumental shift. It'll be the new version of um, what, the, what the web was originally supposed to be, which is just like the tome of all of humanity's knowledge. The new version of the library will clearly, I think, probably look like that. Um, it'll be interesting to see it play out. The final thing I wanted to say was we actually saw 
what it looks like when a big enterprise wants to get involved in Web3. <laughs> so about this time last year, uh, Meta got into contact with us and they wanted to store NFTs for Instagram. So for a start, they were like already late to the, um, <laughs> to the, to the wave, let's say. Like I think the NFT wave more or less peaked in November 2021, approximately. So they got started late. And then they, they dilly-dallied around for like 10 months trying to build what is essentially a 15-line integration that pushed data to Arweave. And they did, and they pushed data for a while. And then, you know, their shareholders got very upset with all the focus on Metaverse, and they killed it like a month ago. <laughs> so um, that is what I imagine a lot of enterprise adoption of Web3 uses, use cases will look like for the, first, for the next five years, I would expect. Like, they're going to be the innovation department that is trying to keep up with or answer the innovator's dilemma um, not very well. Is like, you know, they will try and mold their old business model into the new thing, basically. And it probably won't work very well, and, and it won't fly. Um, but then at the end of the game, they will be forced to adapt to the new business models that are created. That's my hunch. Kind of sounds like AOL, where there was a time when they were like, they were the web. I think they were responsible for more CDs in the world than literally anything else. Um, and a lot of people thought, like, there was a time when you had to develop your app on top of either AOL or Prodigy or whatever the third one is. And there was people that thought it was absolutely crazy to suggest that you should build for this open thing, the web. And now AOL is worth nothing. It still exists. And yet it's kind of like Sam was talking about. It's basically nothing. Um, machine learning and AI have really been blowing up lately. I think every presentation today has mentioned it. Um, how do you see its existence uh, influencing the development and growth of the permaweb and vice versa? How does the fact that we now have permanent data, which we didn't have you know, not too long ago uh, as, as AI was kind of being talked about, how is that permanent data going to impact the development of AI and ML? Um, and are there any specific use cases or synergies between the two that you see? Go ahead and start with you, Well, I, I'm afraid I just, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I think it could be a, a, a big deal, but we will find out. I think that there's, there's a parallel track here also, which is are we as a provenance log for information? So in a world um, where it's possible to create synthetic you know, imagery or videos or, or, or text content, um, yeah, like on the fly that, that is built to say, uh, convince anyone that is reading or listening um, that, who knows, of a political opinion or to buy a certain product. I think like the hyper-targeting that will be available as a result of this technology will, will lead to a world where b provenance guarantees will matter so much more. And basically, Arweave was built from the beginning to be just a ledger of information, a permanent ledger of information, who said what and when, um, with a bunch of metadata that you can add as, as arbitrary tags. And so we see that the use of the system as to strongly track the sort of information supply chain, if you will, will probably be quite big um, as, as this shift in society happens. But frankly, I mean, the, the, the most interesting thing about AI, right, is that like it's a massive question mark. <laughs> like um, it's very hard to predict what will, what will be the, the situation we find ourselves in 18 months from now. But certainly cryptographic guarantees that the information hasn't been changed over long periods of time seems like a useful thing to have. We'll find out. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm... Oh. There. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm definitely not, uh, you know, an expert, um, you know, in, in AI either. Um, but I do see, yes, it's our weave is this immutable data lake. What better place to train your, your AI, right? Um, you could example 10, 20, 30 years from now can look back on this data set from 2023, knowing that it hasn't been changed or modified. 20, 30 years, 50, however many years, our cultures can change, our society changes, things get canceled. You can't do that on the permaweb, so you'll know that uh, yeah, that information was true from the time that it was uploaded. So that could be, yeah, really powerful uh, long term um, and could maybe eliminate effects of like AIs that are kind of just training on, you know, the latest few years of data, kind of creating this echo chamber or something. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there could be use cases like that um, on top of just tools like ChatGPT just vastly helping all the builders, right? Anyone building now, these tools can really, you know, 10x 
their software development, their communications, all of those things. So I think it's, it's just in general helps teams uh, go a little faster. Um, yeah, uh, to just briefly touch on the very last thing Phil just said, uh, I think GitHub Copilot has probably been the largest quality of life change for me since I got a phone. Um, it, it is a massive quality of life upgrade as a developer. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm also not uh, exactly an expert in AI. There's really been one particularly interesting uh, conversation I've had regarding AI. It was with some researchers based out of Europe. Um, and so one of the really common issues in uh, science, and this is what a lot of people in the DSI or decentralized science community are trying to solve, is how we can mix and match data in new ways and do that coherently. And coherently means that a computer can understand it. Because uh, the issue they were having was that right now you have, you, know, you might have studies from the US and uh, you know, Europe and Asia and all over the place, and they are finding interesting things, interesting points of data. And they all store that in their, in their own formats. Um, and when they get an AI model that they want to, because an AI model, uh, at least as I understand it, and once again, not an expert, it uses a vector database to find patterns, and essentially pattern recognition, and it can give a decent prediction on what the, you know, the, the next pattern will be based on an incomplete pattern. And uh, what they want to do is they want to take all of these, all this data that is in all these different formats, and they want to find interesting relationships between them. Um, but that's really hard for a computer to do because they're in different formats, and uh, you know, the computer can't exactly translate that one to one. Um, the really cool thing about Web3 is that you can tie tokens to data. And I think this is particularly true in the ROV ecosystem. You can tie tokens to data. And so if you can incentivize people to conform their data, it doesn't have to be the primary source, but secondary source conform their data to a new format with tokens, you can now find interesting relationships that you couldn't find before with data that was one siloed and two in different data formats. Um, once again, not an AI expert, but uh, this has been probably the most interesting AI discussion I've had regarding uh, are we even Quill specifically? Yeah, I, th I think on top of that, I would even say that, you know, given are we being an open data lake, um, you could leverage the technology to train AI with, uh, to, to understand the differences between these different formats to then make those types of, um, those type of translation such that we can make sense of the data. I think a large part of, you know, open AI's coherence and, and, and why it's compelling is because you can sort of, you, you can ask it questions based on, you know, everything that was uploaded to the internet. Um, and, and, you know, while we don't have all of the data that OpenAI does, we do have the permaweb. Um, and so perhaps we can be training things off of, off of the permanent data in, in ways that uh, is more accessible, such that you don't have to go through a system that was built by someone like OpenAI, it's more democratized and available. I like that thought actually, just because a, a lot of the work that was necessary in order for that to become useful was the tagging, and we've got tagging right built right into the actual, to each piece of data. Um, okay, let's talk about encrypted data on the permaweb. I, I think that Phil is the only one explicitly working on this, but I assume you all have thoughts about it. Uh, kind of, we have the combination of file persistence and data privacy, if you can encrypt it right. Um, what kind of, Critical concerns are there related to ensuring that that privacy, um, thoughts on the potential threat of it not being future-proof enough? Like can uh, you know quantum computing come along and break the encryption and then we've got this stuff that we thought was gonna be private isn't anymore and what can we do to prevent that? Yeah, this is actually a very interesting question we've been thinking about from the beginning of the, the perm web because of course we realized, hey, you can put encrypted data on this and that means you can get back to it later and it's private, that's great. Right? But then what if the encryption breaks? Um, and it's essentially two different schools of thought. There's the school of thought, which I would say I'm more skeptical of, which says, no, the encryption algorithms we have this time around are unbreakable. But, but my, my feeling is in general that encryption exists in a state of either broken or not yet broken. But you know, at some point in the future, it is likely to be. Um, and that means, of course, it's an, open, it's an open data layer. And if you have copies of the information, uh, regardless of the encryption you use, if you believe that the encryption is going to be broken at some later point in time, then you have a problem. Um, the only comment that I would make about this is that uh, the internet is interestingly also structured this way. So there are a bunch of people here. We're accessing Wi-Fi. We can see each other's packets. The packets are just encrypted. Same with all of your internet traffic. 
Um, the whole way that the web works is basically just encrypted data flows. Uh, and it's not very difficult to tap those data flows. Uh, in fact, there's, there's actually some theory about certain intelligence agencies tapping the existing HTTPS traffic such that when the uh, of certain um, algorithm types, such that in a few years, they think they'll be able to, to crack it fairly quickly, and then they'll be able to get access to old data about the, the flow of information. Um, not sure how true that is. It's just rumors, right? But, but it would make sense. Uh, yeah, I think, I think the same is essentially the case for, for all data flows in society. It's just with our weave, it's, it's even more in your face, I would say. Um, yeah, so as, as we know, our weave is a public blockchain. And for our drive, it was really important for us to not just have public data, but private data. Um, and sure, anybody could take their pictures and put it in a zip file and put a password on it and then upload that to Arweave. Um, but it was important for us to make it really easy for anyone to take advantage of private data on our drive. Um, so we built uh, um, you know, a, a little standard, a little protocol for how we encrypt that data. Figure there's two kinds of encryption you can do, symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. The one that's a little bit, uh, not a little bit, will be broken by quantum computers is asymmetric. Uh, encryption, so that's you encrypt something with one key, you decrypt it with a different key. Um, and there's lots of research that has shown that that is, there's gonna have to be some upgrades to like RSA and a lot of the communication that you do back and forth with websites. However, asymmetric encryption, uh, research has shown that yes, it is, I don't know if the word is quantum, I think they call it quantum resistant, um, which again, who knows what could happen in the future, um, but that basically means you generate a key, and that same key is used to decrypt that, that data. Um, so we put that together in our drive. When you log into our drive, you bring a wallet. We take a signature from your wallet. We combine it with some other entropy and basically come up with a really, really strong password. Because that's the other thing you need to keep in mind. You're putting this file on our weave. It's there forever. If you encrypt it with a password of one, two, three, right? someone can brute force that with a GPU and seconds. Um, so encrypting data on Arweave, you have to have really strong, um, really strong password. But then the other thing to keep in mind is once you have this encrypted file, who are you sharing it with? Because once one other person has the key to decrypt that file, well, they can download it and decrypt it and re-upload it or do anything else that they want with it. Um, there's no way to change an encryption key for a file that's already been uploaded. So it's another really important consideration of who you share your private data with um, on Arweave. Um, and I know there's other systems that are put together to help with uh, control of those keys and act as other layers on it. But um, yeah, those are some of the main considerations that we've, we've thought through uh, for, for our drive. Uh, kind of a funny personal story about encrypted data on Arweave that I had. This is when I was brand new to the Arweave ecosystem. Uh, I was building a decentralized social. And uh, I wanted like typical user login flow, so username, password, uh, but we needed some sort of authentication. We're also committed to being fully decentralized. And so we had some encrypted keys that would get stored on the permaweb and you can decrypt those. And the whole thought process behind that, uh, you should use symmetric encryption, uh, like Phil described, used AS-256, quantum resistant, right? And so I was like, oh, well, as long as you know you don't forget your password, and no one guesses it. It should be safe, right? Um, and actually, it was uh, it was uh, on Open Web Foundry, which is an incubator Arweave was doing. And uh, this guy named Martin Letterer, who works for Tate's team, uh, pretty much in the comments to me said like, "Hey, this is a really bad idea. I don't think you should do this. Um, this is this is definitely not secure very long term." And uh, I actually do agree with him. Uh, it was a pretty bad idea. Um, and so. I, I don't have a particularly interesting solution to encrypted data generally on Arweave, but that's kind of a funny story I have. But for Quill specifically, uh, most of the projects we work with that need private data, uh, recency is also a big factor in that equation. So if data is you know, even a couple days old, they actually don't really care if it's public. Uh, what really matters for them is uh, you know, if data is five minutes old, 10 minutes old, or maybe even less than that, less than a minute old, that is where their data is particularly valuable. And so if we think about the value of any given piece of data, and once again, this is more particular to uh, data stored in relational databases um, as opposed to generalized file systems. But when we think about a lot of the data that we're dealing with, um, the value is really in the recency. You know, 90% or 95% of the value of that data is held in the first 30 minutes of it existing within that database. And so even in our case, and 
for what it's worth, uh, most like tests we've done with, with encryption were symmetric, which uh, means quantum resistant. But for us, even asymmetric encryption, we're still able to really retain 95% of that you know, supposedly valuable data. Um, and so that's sort of our approach to it, is uh, recency is also a factor that a lot of people don't understand. Um, but if you're doing stuff like uh, healthcare data, uh, I would recommend not using blockchain, um, or at least not any, any project I know about, because um, you probably should expect that even the quantum resistant encryption will get cracked um, in our lifetimes. I guess the only thing I'd add to that is that I see the risks of quantum and encryption on our weave as similar to the risks of quantum and encryption on the regular web. Uh, such that if data is decrypted on the open web and someone chooses to share that with others, uh, chances are that you know people can keep replicating that data and it can still be uh, shared in a decrypted manner. Similar to how if it's encrypted, uploaded to Arweave and someone finds the, the password for it uh, and is able to decrypt that, they can share the way that they decrypted it or, or the data itself. Um, the other thing that I would say is that uh, I think, <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, um, I think that systems that are open by default are inherently, like have more optionality than systems that are closed by default for, for things like composability. Um, and so similar to how the web's built, I think that it's powerful that our weave is open by default while giving you the ability to, to permission access to that data if you want. It just occurred to me while listening to us speak about this that we've been approaching this from a very engineer-focused standpoint, which is technically accurate, but we missed a bit of reasonable context here, which is like, okay, well, what is the alternative? The alternative is that you use a closed source system, which is centralized. And it just suddenly occurred to me, wait, hold on. <laughs> if you build an application stored on Arweave, it is open by default. Anyone can audit it, they can look at it, and if it is broken, in terms of security, you can very quickly take the, take the data out. But that means that um, in the same way as Bitcoin, you get this sort of reliability over time. So if the code isn't broken, it's extremely robust. Um, whereas with closed source systems, you get people breaking in and taking the data all the time because they're just kind of like um, a security through obscurity. So in that sense, in the at least midterm, like you know, 10 to 90 years, something like that, a firmware app that's storing your data uh, privately might well be far more secure than storing it in a centralized service, which might just get hacked tomorrow and all your data is on someone else's drive like instantly. Anyway, just cut to me. <laughs> okay, last one, super quick. Uh, we spent some of our time on Capitol Hill trying to convince lawmakers why Web3 is something that should be embraced in the United States. I've been kind of surprised how many of them are like, oh, we don't really care. We don't really you know, see the value in that. Give me your elevator pitch. What are the kind of features, benefits that aren't kind of um, anarchistic are gonna actually resonate with lawmakers? How do you actually convince them that this is a place that should really embrace Web3 innovation? Uh, Web3 values are essentially the values that founded this country. Like, if the country is not in favor of people being able to speak freely or having rights as users of, of you know, services, then like, uh, it's a bit of an acid test for how the country is corroded. Yeah, and I guess if our country isn't, you know, maintaining its position as kind of this leader in technology, then other countries might, right? Talent might leave from us, from the United States, and go elsewhere. Um, and, you know, as a founder of a Web3 company, it's really difficult trying to follow the right laws and know what to say and not say about what we're doing. So even just having some playbook guideline something instead of the gray area that exists, I think um, would be much better and you know, stop stifling, I think, some of the, the innovation that can happen in the country. Yeah, I mean, kind of similar to what Phil just said, it's going to happen, the question is whether or not it's here. Um, I don't think a single person up here on this panel uh, got into Web3 for money. I think I would have just gone and done something else. We are here because we believe in what we're doing. Uh, I hope that's in the US, but if it's not gonna be in the US, then I'll just go and do it somewhere else. Um, for obvious reasons, I'm not going to name them, but I know of several projects that they have moved their legal entity as well as they've had to take uh, pretty radical steps to not have uh, official U.S. ties or not have a lot of the organizations in the U.S. for this exact reason. Uh, it's going to happen. It's just really a question of whether or not it's going to be here. 
think if a government's coming at it from the perspective of trying to uh, create safety uh, for the citizens that are within that government, I, I'm all for working together with those governments and establishing transparent regulations and legislation such that we have, you know, uh, clarity on how we can actually innovate on top of it. I think it's pretty clear that this technology makes it more accessible and easier for more types of people to build on top of than the traditional web. Um, and so clarity is, is, I think, something that we're aligned with. I, I think I can speak for all of us and say that we're not trying to you know, <laughs> cause a lot of problems and, and create, you know, DeFi Ponzi schemes that cause people to lose a lot of money. We're just trying to continue building uh, in the space and innovating uh, in the country. Well, gentlemen, it's been an honor and privilege to be up here with you. Really, thank you very much for being here and let's give them all a nice big round of applause. <laughs>